this is uh, your host, uh, Guillermo Sabatier, and welcome to the show of uh, Perspectives on Energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Um, again, I am the Director of International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute, where we uh, one of the products we offer is a training in industrial skills. Uh, before I begin the show, I just wanted to express my deepest condolences and uh, and sadness that, that we share on what Hawaii is undergoing right now with the tragedy of these fires. Uh, so many lives lost and uh, so much loss overall, uh, hoping that uh, the missing are found and that uh, this sort of tragedy is addressed quickly and doesn't, doesn't happen again. But uh, definitely is uh, something to watch and uh, it is again a tragedy. So uh, thank you for t thank you for attending today's show. And uh, we're going to discuss the um, usually the ongoing issues with wildfires and a lot of times it's um, what role, if any, the utilities play in this, and specifically when it comes to vegetation management. Now, as it is now, right, with the uh, with the fire in, in this particular instance, right, there is a lot of speculation at this time regarding uh, whether the utility in charge there was responsible in some form for this fire starting or having some kind of equipment failure. Well, at this time, it's um, I am I will point out that uh, that is currently under investigation, and like any. Uh, due diligence and, and uh, what we're utility, they are going to run this down to understand what the root cause was. Um, I'm sure not in an effort to avoid blame, but rather an effort to find what happened to make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, that being said, right, it, it's, uh, I, I still don't have an opinion at this time regarding what happened or what the root cause was. I will, however, discuss what uh, how some of these wildfires start and oftentimes what role uh, vegetation management has played in certain utilities, right? Um, their their examples of those include what had happened in California. Something is happening right now in uh, in uh, Canada, and uh, what I've experienced myself uh, in uh, Florida. Uh, and there's there's quite quite distinct differences in all of those environments, right? So I can imagine that these differences also play a role in what is happening in Hawaii at this time. Um, let's start off with the fact that uh, climate climate changes, of course, has an impact on how uh, Certain areas become drier than others. Uh, some of them may be seasonal, but some of them may be exacerbated or more pronounced due to due to the uh, climate differences. Or, and one of those in this case perhaps was the fact that, and in other places, was the fact that um, warmer than normal temperatures and uh, reduced rainfall, which leads to a certain dryness in the vegetation. Um, one point was well, something that I wanted to point out, of course, is that in uh, the wildfires in California several years ago. A lot of those were brought about with uh, a combination of factors. Um, one of those, of course, was the uh, the change where they were no, no longer allowing controlled burns in some of those forests over over many years. Ultimately, uh, not having a controlled burn in certain forests, of course, uh, creates a lot of un undergrowth and underbrush that becomes fuel for a fire later on and a much more powerful fire. And it spread a lot more quickly. So that was one contributing factor. Of course, the fact that there had been a, dr a prolonged drought in the area, along with um, qu quite a bit of winds, uh, also caused a problem. Now, there were there's some of the fires started with uh, lightning strikes, and uh, with their, and usually those are a significant uh, <clears throat> occurrence where a fire begins. <clears throat> Excuse me, but according to uh, According to EEI.gov, a lot of these like uh, wildfires usually start off with, uh, well, I'm sorry, according to the uh, U.S. Forest Service and the National Park Service, a lot of those fires, wildfires begin, of course, due to uh, some kind of human in human human intervention, whether it's a uh, campfire, a cigarette butt, or leaving some equipment running or some equipment failure, right? The rest of those times usually can be attributed to some kind of natural 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 causes, such as a lightning strike. Um, in some cases, even for example, dew in the morning, uh, acting these droplets, of course, with some sun rising over, eventually acts as, as little magnifying glasses that, of course, concentrate a beam at a certain point. Now, you know, th those are rare, but those have been known to also happen. So, aside from all these causes, let's look at the. Uh, those are those you know the eighty five percent of those according to the National Forest Service, which begin due to human causes. Um, focusing specifically on those that have to do with the uh, or often or, or often enough that are attributed to the utilities. 
So um, as the governing body that, that manages or, or has regulations in place and standards that govern the, uh, the utilities, NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, has standards in place, I think it's FAC 003 and 008, that um, dictate how a utility must maintain easements and right-of-ways for transmission transmission lines. And transmission lines, in this case, above 100 kV, 100,000 volts. Uh, namely because of the uh, Northeast blackout, which uh, we had an anniversary for recently, uh, was started in part by uh, vegetation contact. So vegetation management is a big role in transmission uh, rights of way, uh, so much so that that is one of the most uh, commonly violated standards. Uh, and uh, But in spite of that, that's something that the utilities do uh, expend a lot of resources, right, in maintaining, whether they have, for example, a very robust um, vegetation management program or they engage in uh, everything from AI to satellite imagery. And they even use a, a large host of contract because their, their, their full-time function is to, main, is to trim those trees that are getting anywhere near those uh, transmission lines, anywhere near those like uh, rights of ways, which is usually the easements. And then, of course, um, they even employ those uh, aerial tree trimming crews, which is usually a helicopter with a, uh, with a uh, saw blade that is hanging beneath it. And that's how they, they, they fly across and they trim those uh, those trees that are on on the sides of the right of way, and then of course there's also tree trimming that happens in in the in the right of way underneath the lines. So quite a, quite a bit of work, and many many miles of tree trimming, many many miles of monitoring, and for the most part we haven't seen uh, very much um, fire started by a uh, a transmission line that has a tree contact. But of course the primary driver, the motivator for that tree trimming and that vegetation management is to avoid a transmission outage that could lead to a cascading outage that can eventually lead to another blackout. Uh, for a distribution situation where it's, it's voltages that are, you know, uh, maybe 38, 35 kV and below, and that's probably what we're looking at here and what happened in the, in the fires in uh, California, um, those were more of a distribution outage. And of course, there's many more miles of, of power lines for distribution under off for transmission and uh, a lot more area to cover. Uh, and NERC does not govern uh, vegetation management for distribution circuits. There are other entities that govern that, whether it's the, the public service commissions and the uh, local entities like uh, state, county, and, gov and uh, also local governments. But the mandates and requirements are in a strict, and rightfully so, because it is quite quite the task to be able to maintain all that. Usually, what what becomes a driver for vegetation management is uh, avoiding momentaries, avoiding con tree contacts, avoiding outages, and that's where where in more populated areas. Now, once you get into areas that are more remote where you have uh, away from population centers, um, rural settings, or just basically in nature where lines are crossing through highly wooded areas, that becomes a little more challenging. But vegetation management does happen there a lot of times, and they do maintain that. So uh, what happens in some cases here is where you're going to see where vegetation growth happens rather quickly. In spite of the, uh, the droughts and in spite of the arid conditions, that does take place. Now, uh, one of the clients that we had at one point, uh, I'm not going to mention where or who, but they had a fire mitigation uh, project that they needed our help with, and we helped them determine you know, what that was. And uh, along with help, along with the help from their uh, local governments and their public service commission on the distribution side, they came up with a process in which, uh, rather than shutting power off, you know, before a fire started. I mean, or before a fire was approaching, what they would do, of course, is um, making sure that the reclosers were off, right, uh, for any given uh, feeder that was coming out of a substation in an area that was prone to fire or already had the fi high elevated fire risk. Uh, what does a recloser do? Well, a, rec like a recloser uh, basically allows the line to reclose once it has that initial uh, line outage, meaning something made, made contact with it. And for the most part, mo mo most of those like line contacts are momentary, meaning that that fault will clear and then the system will then again re-energize that line 
and then everything is more or less back to normal. But in an in a period or in a condition where you have uh, uh, an elevated fire risk, usually you don't want to reclose that because then you're going to end up with a, a more than likely a fire at that point. So in this case, uh, those reclosures are usually shut off, and that's a typical condition. The other the other situation is that um, they would suspend the switching, uh, especially remote switching in the field, because of course they were afraid that was going to cause a spark or something, and that that would potentially uh, start a fire or ignite uh, nearby vegetation. So what they would do is if any switching needed to be done, they would dispatch a crew to observe the, the, the switching take place and the switching was done remotely. And then they were they would verify that nothing nothing ignited around the area of that, uh, of, of that equipment out in the field. Um, and it, so far it's, 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 it's worked pretty effectively. Now, the reason utilities don't uh, preemptively de-energize circuits uh, whenever there's a fire coming or whenever there's a hurricane approaching or whenever there's flooding expected, uh, there is there is a protection system in place that will automatically de-energize that anyway. So to, to de-energize equipment preemptively, uh, what, I, what my experience has been is that that tends to put more lives at risk than than it protects and in a lot of cases right a good example of that would be you, you're losing a lot of the alarming a lot of the monitoring you're losing a lot of the um a lot of the infrastructure that's being supported such that such as uh lift pumps and and, and sewage stations that of course would help uh keep water running for uh, of course firefighting or for example you lose power to households that would otherwise you know have have uh, some kind of uh, availability of information meaning they're able to watch the news and uh, that becomes a risk at, this, at that point. So usually the, the suggestion to shut power off preemptively is, is uh, often as an industry has been decided not to do that, uh, usually under very special circumstances. And a case in point was one time in Florida, there was a hurricane approaching uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida, and they're expecting a severe um, storm surge. And one of the suggestions made by leadership was to actually de-energize entire substations. But the, but that of course was determined that 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 risk was not worth it because of course you're putting more lives at risk and it's not the policy of the utility to do that. Instead, they just have the uh, heightened awareness and and at that point, should the water uh, impact the utility, that those circuits would get quickly de-energized anyway, with the with the station's automatic protection that is already calibrated and set just for that condition. So uh, the other thing is if you de-energize equipment preemptively you decide when you're going to do that or how long will you be out and when do you think it's safe to put that equipment uh, back in service so that that of course puts you at another level of risk right at this point where where you're going to cause more problems than you than you avoid but again uh looking at this hap looking how this transpired i'm very curious to see how this um uh, what this investigation will reveal um Comparing that to what's happening in Canada, right now they haven't attributed those fires to anything related to uh, to a utility up there, but rather it's some some lightning strikes and rather dry and warm conditions, especially with this drought. So uh, that 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 investigation is still ongoing. Uh, when wildfires would happen in Florida, uh, again it all depended on the time of year. It was dependent on the time of year, but uh, in Florida there's examples where the wildfires would happen in areas that of course were brought about by usually lightning strikes florida being the lightning capital of the year of the world that was definitely a a fire brought about by lightning the challenge there of course is uh, uh and, and i saw a video where where there was a uh show the conductor arcing and uh, the problem was that i already saw smoke already in the background so usually when there's a fire already happening and the line's energized um that fire, that smoke getting up near, near the conductor will ionize the air. And of course, that'll cause uh, an arc to happen and the line will relay out anyway because of that. So that will be a fault. But the, at that point, the fire will, the fire was already burning and which smoke in the air, of course, uh, makes, uh, means, like I explained, makes the air more conductive. Right? It'll ionize the air. And that way you have an arc that happens and you have the fault taking place. In Florida, uh, one of the things they always worry about is, of course, when uh, usually uh, the fires there that become concerning are the agricultural fires. Uh, usually they have prescribed burns, uh, namely in the uh, sugar uh, sugarcane fields. 
And a lot of times those prescribed burns are planned and they're monitored and you, usually it happen when the weather conditions are right, meaning that uh, the wind is blowing in the correct direction. But there's always instances where, you know, you run the risk where that fire will burn out of control in the wrong direction. So how does that impact us? Well, in Florida, there's a lot of uh, 500 kV transmission lines that I, that run across a lot of those, that farmland. So once that takes place, you run the risk of losing those lines um, due to due to that fire and that smoke. But when I say lose, I mean you know, that line will of course relay out and stay locked out until the fire is over. So losing a 500 kV line is rather severe in that case, especially when you have a hot day with a lot of imports. So um, uh, usually you know it's coming and you prepare for it, but at the same time it's not a it's not a pleasant experience to undergo for any utility. Um, so now talking about Hawaii and what's happening there, uh, one of the things that I think we may see coming forward perhaps could be a change in how vegetation management happens. Uh, my experience with uh, vegetation management uh, due to hurricanes, uh, there's a few cities in Miami um, that have a lot of like um, historic ornamental trees that the city itself would always resist and oppose and push back on any indication of like needing to trim them. Often what happens is um, a lot of those, those conductors usually run right alongside the street or, or, or behind houses. And uh, a lot of residents tend to plant trees and palm trees and everything else right underneath those lines without really considering the, the danger of what they're doing. So of course, at that point, the utility is forced to go ahead and, make, and trim those trees. Problem is that you're not allowed to trim as a hedge. You're then forced to trim in a V cut uh, in the same axis as the actual line. So viewed from the street, it appears like the tree has not been cut, but that line is running usually along that uh, along that uh, that, that V cut axis. Now with, with enough wind, of course, eventually those those limbs may actually hit, but usually the trimming uh, places the, those limbs far enough away where they don't pose a risk. Now, once a hurricane happens, uh, all bets are off, especially with high winds. Uh, what that can do to vegetation. So usually those trees hit those lines, and then of course ripping them off and breaking poles, you have a sustained outage. Usually at that point, right, the public in the city is a lot more uh, agreeable when it comes to engaging in tree trimming or removing certain trees, certain problem trees in certain areas. But usually the formula is that once enough customers have been restored, usually that that uh, resistance comes right back, right back, and then they want to oppose any further tree trimming at that point. So usually it's a lot of uh, a lot of public relations, you know, what they say, convincing the public to plant trees in a smart location and not plant them in an area where it's going to grow right into the line. And um, in Hawaii, I imagine that there's a lot of like uh, a lot of grassland in some places where those those areas caught on fire rather quickly. And of course, given the fact that there was a uh, storm not not far to the south, that increased the uh, the wind, which of course that picked up the wildfire risk, which spread the fire quickly. And the other the other problem there, of course, is that you have a lot of embers that are picked up and those, uh, you may have a wildfire right now, uh, maybe two miles away from your home, but all of a sudden in, in, in a few minutes time, thanks to the wind, the flying embers, the fire will be uh, you know right on your house before you know it. So that that is the uh, the challenge, right? With with windy conditions, dry conditions, and then how they're they're able to pick up lit embers and deposit them in an area that's really far away from the fire that wasn't considered a risk. So those are the things that are definitely uh, interesting in that regard. I'm really curious to see what will happen with this investigation. It may be a while. Um, I understand there's already there's already a, a lawsuit in place. Uh, so I am wondering how what that would reveal at this time, but I'm. Really curious to see what that investigation will yield, and uh, hopefully we'll get down to the truth in this case. And uh, no opinion yet as to what what caused it, but uh, hopefully we can all learn from what happened. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and put them in the comments below, and I'll try to answer them as soon as I can. And again, everyone stay safe and uh, best wishes. Thank you again.